Hey, Merry Christmas. You go, wait a minute, Bob, it's not Christmas. No, it's not, but you know what? Today, it's the Christmas story. It's Luke chapter two. And the beauty of having this opportunity to talk about the birth of Christ when it's not Christmas, well, here's what you'll discover. You'll discover he was hoping we wouldn't celebrate his birth on just one day every year. No, he's hoping we find our way to the perfect gift every day of every year. Take a listen and uh, find the same. Jesus is the reason for the season. You say, Bob, wrong month. (laughs) Oh, 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 it's not the season for Jesus? Well, I didn't mean it that way. Listen, it might be our problem. It may be that too often and too many reduce the role of Christ so that after Christmas, we seem to put away the wreath and the decorations and the tree and Jesus. He fits inside the box, and we put him up in the attic. See you next year, baby Jesus. Sure nice having you for the few weeks we had you. You're right there next to the train, up in the attic. Bye, Jesus. (laughs) No, 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 no. And that's why when you work your way through the Gospel of Luke, you end up in chapter 2. And there you find the Christmas story. And there you find, listen, the season for Jesus, there's a reason that he hopes to get into every season of our life. A dry season, a hard season, a real sad season. It's Luke chapter 2, the first verse we read, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Pause right there your attention, please. Number one, Jesus came for the season of patriotic pride. Patriotic pride. Bob, I don't know if I saw that. Listen, listen. If you didn't see it, I'll take you back to the three-word phrase, in those days. In those days. Those days? Yeah, the days when Caesar Augustus ruled Rome. Powerful. I'm choosing to tax all people. Everyone in the world will be taxed. Why? I'm Caesar Augustus. Yeah. And you know I deserve it because I... I'm a part of this season for Rome we call Pax Romana, Pax Romana, Roman peace. I am one of four emperors that will bring peace here to Rome. And how will I do it? Well, listen, it's kind of an odd thing because it's not just because there's this time where they're absent from war. No, what they decided to do is with a real strong arm, just beat into submission anyone who opposed them. So yes, Rome has peace, unlike any other time. The problem, it's good for all the Romans. If you're Jewish, nah. Why? They have so much power. Listen, here are the Jewish people, and this is our expression of faith, Rome is over us. Yeah, we gave them too much power. You see, in some nations, their history Well, like our own, we have founding fathers who left where government was over faith. They decide to start a new nation. This new nation, faith will be over government. And that's why in the Declaration of Independence of the 56 signers, 27 of them were trained ministers. They were clergy. They were pastors. They say faith needs to be over government, not government over faith. Please. But if somebody wants to have all power, all power, no, we will now 
Move faith from being over government to under government, and then government will begin to dictate what you're allowed to do in faith. And here's what we're going to do. The faith thing that used to, oh, the Bible used to actually be the classroom textbook. There was a time where the Congress actually printed Bibles. Well, you know what? That's given those people of faith way too much power. It's time for us to say no Bibles, no prayer in school, no. And right now the big debate is where Jesus is allowed to be in government. Bob, if uh, Rome was experiencing this season under these four leaders, great peace, it's at that time God decides it's best to bring Jesus to planet Earth. Listen, listen. If you're a Roman citizen, you think it's great. If you're a Jewish person, you think it's horrible. And you're looking on going, this can't be it. And it's at that point in time, God says, listen, my people, if you're bothered by government, oh, let me remind you of something. Keep your place in Luke chapter two. Go with me to Isaiah chapter nine. Look at me at verse six. Isaiah 9 and 6, it's your Christmas card. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. For upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Come on back your attention, please. God says, listen, I realize some of you really like the government. Some of you really don't like the government. Can I remind you? There'll never be one guy that makes everybody happy. Not until that guy is the guy, and that guy is the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we all understand that? So between that time, what should I do? Well, first of all, don't put so much hope in government. And I'm saying that as practically as I can. Why? Because even if everything was great, and even if affordable health care was actually affordable health care, even if we had a foreign policy that made everyone, you know, surprised at just how smart we are, even if everything was all right, that kind of pride, God would still look on and say, no, 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 please. Why? Jot it down. Philippians 3 and 20, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we shall also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it might be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he's able to do all things even to himself. The whole idea is that you're not like, oh, I love my government, I love my country, it's everything. No, heaven's everything, and you're looking forward to a new government. Oh, I love my body, and this is the one I want to take to heaven. No, you really don't. It'll just be continued. It, it'll get worse. Uh, it, and then you want the new one. Everything is going to change, and that's why we hope for heaven. But when it comes to my citizenship, well, stay with me on the thought. In Psalm 33, in verse 12, the Bible says this, happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. Now, if it sounds redundant, whose God is the Lord, it, it's not, because the word Lord in the Hebrew Scripture is Jehovah. You see, the Bible says, happy is the nation whose God is the Bible God. Once you get the Bible God, he has the power to bless a nation. Now, here's what I think we've mistakenly done. Hey, we're a blessed nation. We found our freedom. And if you live in another foreign country and you serve a different God, come here and make it your home. So we were supposed to be a melting pot. Everyone came from every country and said, this would be my homeland. The problem is it's not a melting pot. It's a beef stew. Not everyone melted. So some folks from another Arab country come over and they say, hey, we got freedom here to worship Allah the same way you worship Jehovah. Now we've got Allah and Jehovah sharing the same space. And then somebody else comes over and says, hey, here's our God. This is Buddha, and we're going to worship him. Now, you want to be nice and give everyone freedom, but right now we're in a nation that goes, well, our nation's God is everybody's God, and whatever you want to do, you can worship it, whatever it is. And our God's looking on and going, 
that's not how it started. And if you want to do that, you can. But the next time you find yourself face to face with a real enemy, you will call on your God. And I'm wondering, who are you going to call on? And, and that's how it gets so confusing. Because if our nation truly was serving and worshiping the one true God, Jehovah, we'd be very clear about how we feel about most of everything. But we had to become all things to all people. We had to become everyone's place for every God to come. And now Jehovah continues to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. There's no room for Jehovah God. I think he has an opinion about that. And I have an opinion about that. And that's why I'm here to get email <laughs> from everyone who has a different opinion. But honestly, I welcome it. Because every time you send me something that's, well, I think that, I think that, I'm just gonna send you a Bible verse, okay? And my hope is that at some point in time, you figure out, you, I, I hope you figure out at some point, this is not about my opinion. I'm here representing one. His name is God Almighty. He's the one that's above all the other gods. And it may sound, listen, it might sound narrow and bigoted. It might sound condescending and anti every other god. But I believe there is one true God. And, and again, I think he wants to be honored as God. And even when the country comes to the place where they go, I think your God belongs there and your God belongs here. And we as the government will decide where the gods belong and who worships who and how they were. At some point you go, oh, 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 oh. That's why we left that other nation. Bob, you saw that in the first three verses? Well, <laughs> kind of. Let's go back to Luke chapter 2, this time pick it up in verse 4. We read, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. If you'll stop right there and this time, jot it down. Jesus came for those seasons of human abuse. We tend to abuse when we misuse God's intended purpose. And the way that it works, and it's almost this satanic setup, I'm bothered, I have pain, I have trouble, I don't know where to turn, I'm stuck in my sin, and because I don't know necessarily how to access God, I believe that there's more, I believe that it's beyond, but I don't know how to access God, I'm looking to get rid of the pain. And the only way I know to deal with the pain is medicate. So it's a bottle, or it's a drug, or sometimes it's a relationship, sometimes it's a business deal. All of those things that can keep us away from the pain, we will employ. The problem, my friend, is that until you deal with the pain, you simply complicate the problem. Because the problem is exacerbated each time we don't find a solution, but simply medicate because of the pain. And how far have we come? You may if you're older than me, not even know this is happening, but younger than me knows that it can be hard to understand why people cut themselves on purpose, but cutting is actually a way some people try to cope with the pain of strong emotions, intense pressure, or upsetting relationship problems. They may be dealing with feelings that seem too difficult to bear or bad situations they can't change. Cutting? The first time I ever heard that a kid was doing this was a few years back, and it was through a counseling. And they said, yeah, they started cutting. And I go, no, cutting. And I imagine paper trying to, you know, make something. and just emotional, ah, like, you know, OCD thing. They go, no, 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 cutting. And I go, really? Like, I'm a teenager, and I have so much pain that I sit down, I find a razor blade, and then I actually take my arm, and I just start cutting myself? Human abuse? Bob, there's pain. I know, I know, and I know, and it pains me to think if we've done a poor job helping you to understand how accessible and available he is. You see, he came to planet Earth as a human baby. 
And when I use those two words, human, baby, it's very intentional. He came as a human, a human. God could have sent a savior in a different flavor. It didn't have to be human. He could have sent something that was very, very supernatural, something that kind of glowed, something that didn't have flesh, but some kind of body that we wouldn't even be familiar with. Why? Because we're familiar with fish, we're familiar with birds, we're familiar with reptiles. He made a body of flesh. He could have upgraded that to something that would be much more divine. He could have, but he didn't. And if you don't know why, keep your place in Luke's gospel, the second chapter. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter four and pick it up this time with me in verse 14. Hebrews four and 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast to our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. Come on back, your attention, please. Friday, I did a memorial service. We now have a new widow in the body, a young one with a three-year-old. Dad went home to be with the Lord, and one of the first things that happened is that she spent time talking with another widow. Why have a widow talk to a widow? Simple. 2 Corinthians 1 and 3, praise be to the God of all comfort who comforts us in our trials so that with the comfort we receive, we can go comfort someone else. You see, the reason human baby There are times in our life where we want to talk to God, and yet we're convinced, well, you're so big, and you're so mighty, you don't understand. You would never know what I went through. God, do you have any idea what I'm going through right now? And my God, here's what the scriptures say. He sympathizes with our weakness. He's the one you can turn to and say, hey, God, yesterday I had a really bad day. Oh, let me tell you bad days. I completely understand. And I don't know how often you realize, but that he, being so sympathetic, in the following verse offers amazing grace. He says, not only am I really sympathetic and I really understand because I walked in your sandals, he says, I'll tell you something else. I so understand that when you finally come to me for help, you're gonna walk into a throne room that's dripping with grace. Why? I'm waiting to help you in your time of need. You see, to think for a moment that we tuck Jesus away into a specific seven-week span and don't access him every day of the year, he says, I would like to be accessed every day of the year because I know there's going to be a season. And the reason I came is to make sure that you knew if you're cutting, cut no more. Because... Isaiah 53 and 5 says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We cut him so that we wouldn't have to cut. We bruised him so we wouldn't have to bruise. We took all of our junk and laid it on him so we'd be free of the junk. (laughs) It's got to be human pride that would just push aside the Lord Jesus Christ and not yet. I need a drink. You're going to swap out Jesus for a glass of vodka? What are you you doing? Did did we miss this? Did, Did we miss how big he is and how great he is, but how compassionate he is and how sympathetic he is and how interested he is? in every little dumb thing that happens in your life. He loves you. And if you think that's patronizing your humanity, no, it's simply saying he cares about the big stuff, but he also cares about the little things in your life. And sometimes you wait until all the big stuff, and you find, yeah, he's there. But if you save him for the big stuff, I think small stuff gets bigger. 
I would say go to him with the small stuff now and you may not have any big stuff. Amen? Go back with me to the word this time. Luke chapter 2 and verse 8 we read, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all people. Pause right there. Circle all people. How many is all? All people. Third point, we know that Jesus came for reasons of rejection and ridicule. I'm going to say some things that are going to bother a few of you because you're new to this. But in the Bible, there's a link between a particular animal and you as a Christian. And God in the Bible doesn't call you lions. He doesn't call you tigers. He calls us sheep. They're completely defenseless. So when they see what might be an enemy, they huddle together, making a bigger target (laughs) so that for sure someone gets eaten. Their wool is so heavy they can't swim, but it doesn't stop them from trying. What I'm trying to describe to you is a problem for connecting to God. Because it wasn't just that you were the youngest or not the sharpest tack in the box. The real problem is you can't keep clean. You can't stay kosher. And because we're at a time in Luke chapter 2, after 400 years of silence, the Sadducees and the Pharisees have made worshiping God really hard. You got to do all this ceremonial washing. I got to wash my hands a certain way. I got to keep my dishes a certain way. I'm a shepherd. I can't do any of that stuff. So obviously, God wants nothing to do with me. Listen, man, I love Jesus because there's not a single person that didn't feel alone or far away or empty or rejected or an outcast. Stop the world. That's the one I'm after. I'm after that one right now. They don't feel like I'm interested or that I care or no. I'll be their God. In the fourth point, go back with me to Luke chapter 2. Here's where we close in verse 11. We read, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who's Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you that you'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let's now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste. Now notice the word haste because this is the first Christmas rush. I liked it more than you did. Anyway, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. Now, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all those who heard it marveled at the things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all those things and pondered them in her heart. Come on back, fourth and finally. Jesus came to all seasons of helplessness and hopelessness because he is, and take a look at the word in verse 11, he's the Savior. He's the Savior. Circle the word soter in the original language has everything to do with a person who rescues from eminent danger or destruction. Now, how is it that you're in eminent danger and destruction? Well, you're going to die, and the reason you're going to die is because it's part of the curse. I mentioned the earth. I mentioned your body. I mentioned government. Everything is under the curse of the fall. So you're slowly decaying to die, and then without Jesus, eminent danger and destruction is also called damnation. You don't get to go to heaven. Why? Without a Savior rescuing you from damnation, you don't get to go to heaven. So he says, hey, are there any sinners here that want salvation? So we have sinful people. We have a holy God. Here comes Jesus because he sees that if no one rescues you for certain, it's damnation. So on one day in the whole human calendar, the skies open. There's this hallelujah thing. There's this glory to God in the high. Peace, peace, I'm not mad at you. 
It's goodwill. God's being really good to man. There's a Savior born today for every sinner. If you want to make it to heaven, this is the guy. Now, pay attention to the baby because the baby's going to grow up. And as the baby grows up and becomes a man, know this, that man will say something really, 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 really specific. It's not narrow. It's not bigoted. It's not unkind, but Jesus will let these words come from his mouth. I'm the way, and I'm the truth, and I'm the life, and if you want to get to the Father, you have to come through me. Now, again, that's not narrow or bigoted. That's not, that, that's specific. It's like him really, really making sure you know how to get there. If, if he said, hey, all roads lead, take whatever one you want, then I would say to you, all roads lead, take whatever one you want. He didn't say that. He made it exclusively specific so there would be no error in our judgment or understanding as to how to get to heaven. Well, let me just say, Merry Christmas one more time. Um, you now know that Jesus is for every season and for every reason. But what comes after Christmas? Well, typically it's a happy new year. And here's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that this Bible study brings you closer to Christ so you can have a happy new year every day. You see, it doesn't have to be a fresh start next week or next month I will. Now, how about right now? How about making the decision right now? This will be my start this very moment. There's a number on the screen and there's a web address. Contact us and get your new life started right now because you don't have to wait for new life. That's the whole idea. Jesus came so that the past would be the past and the beginning of a new life, it starts right now. Um, between now and next time, God bless you. Until the whole world hears, I'm Pastor Bob Coy. So I wonder when... You've just you seen The Active Word with Pastor Bob Coy on TV. Now get it to go and take it with you. Search for The Active Word in iTunes and connect to all of our media, the TV program, daily radio podcast, and on-the-go Devo. It's all free to download for your mobile device. Subscribe to the podcast and you won't miss a moment of Pastor Bob's messages, all designed to keep you in step with God's Word. And once you're subscribed, follow us on Twitter and Facebook for the latest Active Word news and Pastor Bob's video blogs, where you can join the conversation on current events and topics and submit your own question for Pastor Bob. I've got a subscriber question. It reads this way, how or can a Christian have ambition for the future while keeping content in his or her current circumstance. iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. It's how you can take the active word from the pulpit to your pocket and with you wherever you go. Come visit us in South Florida at one of our local campuses. Check calvaryftl.org for times and locations. Or call us at 877-444-WORD. Watch for the Active Word with Pastor Bob Coy at the same time next week or visit activeword.org to watch this and other Active Word media 24-7.